Um, so I think, and it's going to be a complicated answer because I think the kind of best strategies, um, the best advocacy strategies really are going to depend on the issues that you're looking at, the level of government that you're trying to influence, and the, um, the policy solutions that you want to advance. But I think the biggest thing that I've learned and that, it, that really helps to move advocacy forward is that number one, you have the engagement of community. Um, and that can be through organizations that have that serve as advocacy representatives of community, but it's even better when you have individuals themselves who really understand and come from the communities that are most impacted. Um, so I would say, it, and it's a variety, it's that the reasons for that are variety and I'll kind of pick up, you know, why I think that's important. Um, but an, I think another thing that is really important too, it's moving work forward and advocacy. Um, it's very dependent on relationships. Um, and so building um, coalitions or having relationships with the champions and the leaders in policy, whether they're policy makers or just leaders within the community, that really helps to move different efforts forward. Um, so on the legislative side, oftentimes, you know, community members themselves, people who live in the local community, they're really the experts, right? They know where the problems are, um, and oftentimes they have the solutions. But what tends to happen is that they may not necessarily have the knowledge of the policy process, or they may not necessarily know what are the legal barriers that they're going to have to achieve. And so that's where um, an advocacy organization like a Change Lab Solutions or even, you know, other organ or the other state or local ad organizations help to kind of do that translation and to demystify those processes. Because um, they're much stronger when people can be engaged, but people often just don't have the time to do that. Yeah. So at the legislative level, um, it's really helping people understand where they can weigh in and the process. Um, and to get them in front of community or to and get them in front of policymakers to really help policymakers understand why this is important. Um, and that can come through um, testimony, through data, through you know success stories or the challenges. Um, and that comes in the line of um, having people come testify at legislative hearings or writing letters of support. So there's so many different ways that people can engage in the process. But I do think the best, um, outcomes are always when community members are engaged. Yeah, I've seen some really creative ways that people have been able to um, lift their voices up. Mm -hmm. um, definitely more engagement on social media through Twitter briefings or kind of the live stream on Facebook. TikTok, obviously we've seen this year has been a really effective tool at engaging in the policy process. Um, and then I've seen people, you know, hold Zoom calls with policymakers. Um, and you can actually have people can, you know, participate from the comfort of their home or call in. Um, you know, sometimes internet is a challenge, so that's a, an issue to work around. But I think in general, people have used technology to help bridge that gap in this time where normally we would be in person. Um, and then also the, you know, picking up the phone and having phone conversations or engaging in that way. I think there have been some challenges for sure. So I chair, um, it's actually a public advisory committee through the California Department of Public Health. It's a, it's, um, a community advisory board. And, you know, we hold our meetings. Our meetings are all open to the public. Um, but we've had some challenges like having people participate or making sure that we're getting the right questions or making sure that people have the chance to participate in public comment. So we do have a way to go, but I, I think um, it's been an opportunity to uh, also leverage these, uh, leverage technology, leverage social engage or social media engagement um, in ways that we probably wouldn't have seen otherwise. I think, um, so the ways in which we've seen effective uses of like a health and all policy strategy is um, really to utilize health related data mm -hmm. um, to then help a coalition or a group of advocates 
identify what are the kind of health, health outcomes that you would want to, as a collective, see improved over time. So Change Lab, for example, has used this in working with like hospital systems in the past where um, the hospital systems and other institutions um, identified a few different health outcomes that they wanted to see uh, uh, improved over time. And what then what they've been able to do is think about the ways that those their systems, whether it's education, um, whether it's the criminal justice system, whether it's food insecurity or food um, kinds of systems, how those different systems could potentially have a positive or negative impact on that particular health outcome. Um, and then that way you're seeing where there are overlaps within a system um, that you can try to eliminate or where there are barriers, right? Where there are competing barriers in those systems. Um, I think the other way that we've seen um, this utilized is to be able to have similar definitions or similar goals across different programs. So a couple of examples have been um, in Washington and Seattle, there the cities or the county sort of set a goal of having zero juvenile um, detentions across the county. And the idea was um, looking, so then um, a couple of ways that they did that was looking at all the different stakeholders that were potentially touching that particular system. And they did trainings on trauma-informed care and they all identified um, trauma-informed um, care or, or, or um, how to have a trauma-informed lens to be able to, again, work, their, work on their own particular issues, but all with the goal of making sure that they were addressing those issues and trying to prevent them from the beginning. So I think it helps to like set, you know, identify and utilize data to understand where there are the highest level of disparities or inequities that together you want to try to address. And then what are some of the um, complementary trainings or frameworks that every single stakeholder or a majority of those stakeholders could utilize to help um, potentially address or impact those particular health outcomes. Um, and then to set the goals and kind of measure over time, how are we achieving those goals or how are we working towards those impacts together? And then that way, you're not necessarily trying to compete for resources, but instead you're working towards the same kind of goal over the long term. Um, so th those are a couple of examples of the ways in which I think having that health and all policies or even an equity and all policies framework can help to, again, set those goals, utilize data, and even potentially identify trainings or other frameworks to use. I think oftentimes in policy and advocacy, um, there's a sort of simplistic way of thinking about success, which is the, the success or failure of a bill or a budget item or a particular policy that we're moving forward. But just like anything else, change takes time. And so I think the ways in which we would advise people or the ways that we've learned um, that you can measure success are a couple of different things. One is um, who are the relation, how is relationship building happening amongst different stakeholders? So for example, there may be a policymaker who you didn't know beforehand, but now they're talking about your issue um, or they've had a staff member reach out to identify you know, how this issue impacts your, their particular district. Um, relationship, like identifying a champion, someone who is actually willing to carry a bill or a budget item or um, move a particular issue forward. So relationship building, I think is important. Um, and that also extends out to people who are now supporting your issue or maybe are aware of your issue that they didn't know about beforehand. So, you know, it's always great to have like economic or business leaders um, who are now supportive of an issue or just a broader group of support. Mm -hmm. Going back to the health and all policies, like maybe you've bridged um, relationships with education advocates or um, human services advocates who, you know, hadn't necessarily known about your issue beforehand or known how to, how to be engaged. 
Um, and then the other thing about this process is that you're really learning along the way. So you're maybe answering tough questions or you're getting closer to answering those tough questions that if you hadn't have had introduced a bill or if you hadn't have held a hearing or met with um, individuals on these issues, um, you wouldn't have these, these questions wouldn't have come to your attention so that you, you know, now you can do a deeper analysis. You can go through and identify, okay, you know, what are the implementation issues that might come that we might need to address. So there's so many different ways in which creating um, or, or moving advocacy efforts forward. There are lots of different ways that you can measure the movement of an issue rather than just looking at the passage or success of a particular bill or budget issue. So this is probably the the hard the hardest thing because there's not just one piece of advice. I think um, the there is a really the most important thing is to think about the process for engaging different stakeholders um, for different a couple of different reasons. One is that you're likely going to have a different level of knowledge and sort of experience um, as you bring different people to the table. Um, and so sometimes it's really important to do a little bit of level setting and ground setting, particularly for folks who don't, who don't necessarily know the policy making process or who don't necessarily know all the laws. Um, so I think making time or building in opportunities to really engage and, and kind of do some education, some, some in, um, enhancing some people's uh, capacity and skills. I think the other thing that's really important is just making time for relationship building. Um, and this is the sort of dreaded, you know, icebreakers or the, you know, the, um, the roadmaps, the life maps, those kinds of things. But what it helps to do is it helps to really have people understand the kind of core values that they're bringing to the table and find similarities in each other. So that when you have to get to those really tough questions or those tough issues, or even when you have a heated debate, you can go back and remember what are those things, what are those similarities that we have in common, um, and how do we move past this tough conversation in order to be able to, to make that change. Um, a couple other things that I think are really important in, in thinking about how to work together as a team is to be upfront about decision making. Um, who makes the decisions and how are the decisions going to be made? Is it consensus or is it, um, and what does consensus mean? And there are great tools out there about how to, um, there are great tools and models around how to have these conversations. But I think it's really important for community members in particular to know, am I just giving feedback and it may or may not be included? Or am I a part of the decision making process? And what does that mean? And then um, the final piece of advice I would say in this whole um, in this whole thing is to really have patience, um, because policy making can be messy, um, but it can also be very very rewarding because of all the things that you're able to achieve, because you're able to build relationships across community, because you're able to understand a problem much more deeply and in a complex way, and because you're able to really utilize the people who are going to be most impacted on a day-to-day -day basis that you know that they're they're going to they're going to be there to support and also implement um, and that it's going to have a positive impact on them themselves and their local communities um, so it's so having patience and really understanding the long view is probably the the biggest piece of advice I would have. 